Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. And together we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics, whatever those might be. So, Cherry, what are we what are we talking about today? We're talking about the woman, the legend, the <laughs> the what again? The lady. The lady herself. <laughs> okay. So uh, she? No. <laughs> Although that is someone. That we could talk about yeah in like maybe like five episodes i don't know if that's enough yeah but um no but it's it's the lady's name today is lu bi cheng mm. um i said and her time if i know what i'm who this is but i don't <laughs> well you did kind of we did prepare this episode I, you told me about it <laughs> okay so uh, well her time does overlap with sushi's a little bit mm. <laughs> so we've talked about the early 1900s period in china a lot on this podcast but what we haven't talked about yet was that in a short period of time, Chinese women were entering the public space. Different from before, women were allowed to play a public role in society and shape society in a real broad sense. I think the key word there is allowed. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so we talked about this a little bit before, but in the concubines to comrades episode, but that was more about how women's how marriage changed yes right not necessarily women's role in society yeah and that 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 episode almost ended up more being about divorce than it was about (laughs) marriage (laughs) yes well this episode is not going to be much about Mm. marriage um for that our woman was never married closet lesbian closet maybe closet historical lesbian maybe okay um but you know a woman doesn't have to not unmarried a woman it's you know it's that's a stereotype so we're not going to support the stereotype. <laughs> so a lot of Chinese women at the time, while seizing this opportunity and fighting for their space in society, they had to navigate this shifting terrain that was China, that was rapidly changing. The, the ground was moving under everyone's feet. Shifting sand, right? Yeah. So they had to, a lot of times, strike a balance between the traditional Confucian ideal of a Chinese woman and the modern emergent concept of a Chinese citizen. Mm. So today's episode is about one such woman, Lü Bicheng, born into the late Qing dynasty. And um, she had a, she lived a very eventful, fantastic life. It was just interesting. So, right, so talk we're going to talk about it. About it. Yeah. So um, Lü Bicheng, she was perhaps most known as a poet, if you Google her today, who excelled in Ci, which was a lyric poetry genre from the traditional classical Chinese poetry. Mm. But to me, what drew my interest to, to are her... Re- are we going to read any of her poems? No. What? Because I'm not cultured enough. No? That. No, unfortunately. Oh, okay. To me, what drew my interest to her was that she was a career woman. Now you said earlier that when I said career woman, I, I make it sound like Korean woman. <laughs> so let's just... Nothing wrong with Korean woman. But she is a Chinese woman, so. But she had a career. <laughs> so, so this was a time when Korea woman <laughs> was very rare in China and everywhere else in the world. Yeah, it's a closed kingdom, Cherry. <laughs> so <laughs> she was an educator, a journalist, a writer, a newspaper editor. Wow. A businesswoman later in her life, a Buddhist near the end of her life. I'm imagining so. like the Barbie dolls coming across with all the yes. different outfits on. Yeah. She was a flight attendant yes. and an astronaut. Yeah. So she played many roles. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because so one of the books that we're going to talk about today is this book called Biographical Dictionary of Chinese Women. The index was not in alphabetical order. It was by type of careers these women had. Mm. So like, you know, a revolutionary because that was a career back then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, medicine or writer, right? Yeah. So, or educator. Or she listed under. Well, she was listed under educator. Oh. But I, it really took me a while to figure out which category I got to look her under. Yeah, she did a lot of things. She was a lot of things. So, so we're going to talk about her. So let's, we're going to dive into her early life first. Okay. And follow her steps from there. So she was born in, nine, in 1883 in Taiyuan. Shanxi province. Mm. Her father was a career, not Korean, bureaucrat. <laughs> At the time, his posting was the provincial education commissioner for the Shanxi province. Uh. 
So you what know, area of China is Sanchi province in? M- middle. Okay, middle. Okay. So a cultured family with a considerable educational tradition, you could say. What year did you say she was born? 1883. Okay, so you said we got to follow her steps. So I, the first question is, yeah, which I guess really sets your entire life ahead of time if you're a young Chinese woman in this period is, did they bind her feet? Hey, listeners, adding this in here, it is highly likely that Li Bicheng didn't have bound feet. She traveled around a lot. She loved ballroom dancing. There were a lot of photographs of her in which she wore normal size heels and shoes. So to not bond her feet, it would have been her parents' decision. Although at this time, most upper to middle class Han Chinese women would have had their feet bound since they were little. So she would have been an exception for sure. After her father retired, they moved back to Anhui province, where her father built a family library that was said to have an extensive collection of 30,000 books. Okay. So he had two sons in the family, but both died young, and four daughters, including Liu Bicheng, our main character. The daughters were known for their talent in poetry and prose writing. And three of the daughters... The older daughters, Liu Bichen being the third daughter, were known as the three famous Lus of the west (laughs) of the Huai River. (laughs) So, and, you know, the book, The Three Liu Sisters Collection of Poetry was also later published. Regional fame was Mm. not an exaggeration. It's like the Jackson Five. (laughs) Exactly. Also, finally, this is at the time where the three Lus, we don't have to say the three Liu daughters, you know, they're just... Three, three, I guess, people with Liu as their last name, mm. um, not gendered. So Liu Bicheng was especially talented, almost like a child protege. Supposedly, she was known to be able to write poems at five and paint beautiful landscapes when she was seven. I wanted to especially mention her mother because we know about her mother quite a bit, which was rare, again, mm. for a married Chinese woman in the late Qing dynasty. Her name was Yan Shiyu. She was a gentry woman. She also came from a family line of scholars. Her grandmother was a famous poet in the 1800s as well. Oh, wow. So, you know, family tradition. Poetry in the blood, Cherry. Poetry in the blood. So, growing up, Li Bicheng was under the influence of her, both of her parents. And she did have a relatively happy childhood, or so we guess, um, by all indication. However, when she was 12, her father passed away. And with no male heirs, only daughters, also Li Bicheng's mother was apparently the second wife of her husband. The first wife um, passed away early. And when you say second wife, you don't mean like... Not a concubine, but actually a wife. Yeah, but like he had two wives at the same time. No. Oh. He married her... He married her after. Oh, okay. So I after, think so. you can still have first wife, second wife, third wife. And well, not I guess have you could. Concubines. Yeah. It's all very complicated. It's all very, yeah. All of these just contributes to A, without a male heir. B, she wasn't, I guess, the original wife. Mm. Um, when Liu Bicheng's father passed away, other members of the family, and by that I mean other male relatives on the father's side, yeah. um, decided that the assets and the properties of the family should go to them. And Yan Shiyu was basically forced out, and they have gotten nothing. So she had to take her daughters back to live with her own maternal family. Luckily, she had one, because she also came from a family of you know, bu- bureaucrats and mm. scholars. So you know, sometimes we say that widows in Chinese history, that really, to become a widow was, you know, was, was one step closer to being in power of the family position, or like the pirate queen Shiyang stepping to the leadership role that their husband had held prior. Yeah. But really, th- one condition, though, is that you got to also have a son. You know, when when very simple and easy to use rat poison came out in the Victorian era, mm. there was a lot of fear that women would just use it to kill their husbands and essentially take over the family. Because, like, why wouldn't they? Yeah. That was the thought. Yeah. Because, you know, like, that's really, yeah, again, that's kind of the only way you, you get independent power is you were married And then you're not, have kids and assets now. And no husband. No husband. Yeah. So another interesting detail worth mentioning was that um, 
of Li Bichun's childhood was that she was betrothed or promised to another known family in town, the Wang family, at the age of nine. So I know it sounds ridiculous today, but I guess that's how it was back in the days. After the death of Li Bichun's father, though, the the Wang family decided to break off the engagement. Mm. So this was now she doesn't have any assets, right? No dowry. Useless. No dowry. So this was referred a lot, referred to a lot in biographies of or articles about Li Bichun. Some even go as far as suggesting that this was the reason why she was never married because she now, again, I guess at the age of twelve, had the status of a rejected woman. Or some suggest that she was too emotionally scarred. I Although I don't, I don't buy that. I don't buy that either, right? She had also discussed romantic interest in her life later, or the lack thereof, because she never married. Mm. And she said what she cared about was what she cared about the most in a potential match was their talent in literature and poetry, which makes more sense because she's mm. like, I don't care about money. I have money because <laughs> she didn't have money later on. Yeah. Um, you know, and sh- so she was very talented and she wanted someone talented and maybe it never worked out. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> but it's not because she was discarded at the age of 12. <laughs> yeah. So um, what I'll say is that the Wong family likely, I think, did her a favor. She was allowed <laughs> to then just live a life, right? Rather than be a betrothed little wife who could not be allowed to have the op- opportunities and live yeah. the very eventful, exciting life that she later did have. Yeah, she'd be living at the permission of her husband. Yes. And if anything, this period of of her life, including this event, contributed more to her transition into a Buddhist later in her life rather than her decision not to marry. Mm. She did mention that these early years of her life were trials that heaven sent to help her find her path. She wrote, quote, Everyone turned on us, our kin opposed us, and blood relations were backbiting human relations were cruelly transformed. Mm. So anyhow, back to teenager Liu Bicheng. She lived with her mom after this um, in rural Anhui first. Then she was sent to live with her maternal uncle, who was the salt administrator of Tanggu, a town near Tianjin. Big deal, Cherry. Big deal. It's like a huge tax thing. Yes. Um, It's like one of the major taxes of the country. Yes. So he did well for himself. So this was seen to move. T- this was seen as a move to provide her with more resources and educational opportunities. Okay. So over there with her uncle, she read, she studied. By the time she was fifteen or sixteen, her poetry was receiving praises from famous scholars in the country. Wow. So now we're in the early nineteen hundreds. Yeah. This is a time when, you know, 100 Days of Reform happened in 1898. Got crushed. Just a few years. Got crushed. <laughs> but but so did she... leave a mark. On... And Renshika. Yeah. Well, you know what? Renshika turned around and did a lot of reform himself. Yeah. As long as he's the one leading it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, he t- had the army, so. He did. So political power. What did Mao say? It comes from the barrel of a gun. <laughs> barrel of the gun. So Chinese society was changing rapidly. And... Again, Nali's favorite Chinese historical <laughs> character, as Nali couldn't help but mentioning him a couple of times already in this episode, <laughs> Yuan Shikai, who was the governor of Zhili, which was the northern administrative region of China, current day, basically like Hebei province. Can right? I talk a little about Yuan Shikai? In a little bit. Okay. Who He was in charge of <laughs> Tianjin. I'm going to sing praises of him, right? Oh, you okay. might be happy about this portrayal for once. Uh. Um, so he was also in charge of Tianjin, which was big metropolitan town, yeah. city, close to Beijing, right? Mm. And a port city. This city will be the center stage of Liu Bichun's early career development as a journalist and as an educator. Mm. And this was an exciting time. The development of Tianjin as a modern Chinese city, it was basically like a project for Yuan Shikai's government. Yeah. So we did two episodes about Yuan Shikai. Uh-huh. Um, I feel like we're going to do more. Yeah. But no, yeah, no, it's interesting because like, so Shanghai was kind of the original international city. Yeah. Right. But that was not, that was kind of organic. There was just so many foreigners there and it wasn't really that development Mm -hmm. really wasn't under Chinese control. Yeah. Right. There's foreigners doing all this stuff. Yes. They had all their concessions, all the stuff built up around it. But when, when Ren Shikai became governor of that province around Beijing, 
obviously he was still just the governor of a province, but he was almost kind of like a president. Yeah. And that he had a he had huge, a lot of power. He had a lot of power over the national budget and immigration and all these other things. Um, and uh, yeah, as you said, he did it as kind of a personal. A personal project. project to modernize. Yeah. Tianjin did have concessions, by the way. There yeah, were yeah. regions of Tianjin, but it was no nowhere near what Shanghai was like. Yeah, obviously. And also, yeah. he had his work cut out for him because this was right after the Boxer Uprising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The local people weren't happy. So, but but yeah, so he modeled the new development of Tianjin after Western city planning mm -hmm. and management styles as well. So he built schools. He built military bases. He built police stations. First police force in China. Yeah. New roads, no city, new city infrastructure, and more, right? Mm -hmm. So he was set out to transform Tianjin. So, and Tianjin did become a somewhat a model of what a new modern Chinese city can be, at least in the eyes of the reformers. Of course, all the reformers were at this point like, yes, this is great, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying all China was saying that, but... <laughs> um, so amongst these new reformers, including, I guess, Yuan Shikai is a reformer now, <laughs> and mm -hmm. other high-level Qing officials were especially focused on one thing, education, mm. of both men and women. Probably Western-style education. His oh, okay. government built the first, rebuilt the first modern Chinese university, which did exist before, but during the Boxer Rebellion, it was basically like destroyed, mm. the buildings and stuff. So it was the Beiyang University. Um, and then they established new schools, such as police schools, medical schools to train doctors for the military, mm -hmm. tradecraft schools, and more. Right? So a lot of Western style. Practical. Practical. Education. Not that ancient Chinese Confucian texts aren't practical, Cherry. But, well, ancient know. China did have craft schools, but, you know, not in a way that, like, that was official and the government was hosting it. Well, they weren't like, it was like apprenticeship type stuff more, right? Yeah. So... Most importantly to our story, the government built women's schools. Mm. In a government report describing Yuan Shikai's achievements in governing and school building in 1906, um, it was said that 40 women's schools for lower education was built in Tianjin and one normal school for higher education was built. At the same time, in 1902, private women's schools were also est established by local elites. So not only the government was pushing for this effort. So maybe you're going to talk a little bit, but why was the government so big on pushing women's schools? Well, I would say because they came to their senses, but there, there was a real reason we're going to talk about in a second. Okay. Yeah. So these private schools, though, established by local elites, the majority of the female students were daughters and young wives from the elite Chinese families. Mm. Um, and the schools were women only most of the time. But it was modern in many other senses that subjects taught included math, English, geography, physical education, singing lessons, and more. And the teachers sometimes were the elite scholars themselves, sometimes were Western-educated young elites, also men, but they also hired female teachers from Japan, because that's where, I guess, East Asian <laughs> female teachers were available. Yeah. Japan, <laughs> they were ahead of us. So not only in Tianjin... There's probably some foreign teachers, too. Yeah. But we're not talking about religious schools here, right? Like We're mm. talking about Chinese elites held or, uh, or, or government-organized government schools. Because religious women's schools have a long history. Have a long history, yeah. yeah. So um, not only in Tianjin, other cities such, such as Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hangzhou, um, all had newly established women's schools at this time. Mm. So with all of this as a backdrop, Lü Bicheng, currently residing in Tanggu, which was the town next to Tianjin City, living with her uncle, of course have heard about these new women's schools in big cities. And one day in 1903, the wife of her uncle's secretary was going to Tianjin to visit a women's school mm. and invited her to go along. Her uncle, however, did not approve. And Liu Bichun wrote that day that, quote, my uncle stopped me and reprimanded me severely. I was extremely angry and decided to break with him. The <laughs> next day, I ran away and boarded the train. When I met, where I met the lady of the pavilion of Buddha's light. So this sounds weird. <laughs> but this, the... the so she joined a cult. No, the, the <laughs> pavilion of Buddha's light was actually a famous hotel in Tianjin. 
Oh, okay. So Yat San has stayed there. Mao has stayed there a few decades later. Mm. So there was a hotel with some, you know, like it was like a landmark, mm. culturally important okay. building. <laughs> everyone who's everyone has been there. Yes. So anyway, so she met, the, I guess she met the lady of the Pavilion Buddha's hotel, like the female owner. Mm. And then she said, who took me along to Tianjin. I had neither traveling expenses nor any luggages with me. Quote. So Li Bichen basically ran away from mm. home at the age of 20. And in Tianjin, she met Yin Lianzhi, the I don't know if it's running away from home if you're already 20. You're kind of just... Well, as a Chinese moving. woman at the time, I guess you were. True. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess if you're 50 and you leave you, home, you're running away. You're from home, yes. <laughs> so in Tianjin, she met Yin Lianzhi, the Manchu Catholic aristocrat, mm. who was also the founder of the newspaper we just mentioned. And um, she met him and his wife. They were so impressed with her that she was made the assistant. Yeah, gotcha. she was one of the three famous Lus. She west was of one the, of the famous. West yeah. of the river. <laughs> so, she, <laughs> so, she made, so she was made the assistant editor of the newspaper. They also provided lodging for her, so she lived with them. And he and his wife took her to social activities introduced her to members of the Chinese high society. Mm. She studied Western logic with the famous scholar Yan Fu, who was known for translating Western scientific works and the philosophy of enlightenment. Mm. And so, you know, this she was fully brought in into this circle of Chinese high society, scholars, elites. Mm. And um, there was this picture of Liu Bicheng and Ying Lianzhi's wife together, and it almost looked like they were a pair of mother and daughter. And interestingly, Liu Bicheng was always mentioned by name in sources of this photograph. I've seen a few of them. She was Liu Bicheng. But the wife was always mentioned as the wife of Mr. Ng. <laughs> She's married, therefore she no longer has a name. You know. Maybe that's why Liu Bicheng didn't get married. Maybe. She's seen it firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> so, and from there, her career takes off. She not only edited the newspaper, but also wrote articles that published in it. She also wrote for other women's newspapers, such as Chinese women's newspaper, Zhongguo Nü Bao, and Women's World, Nü Zi Shi Jie. Mm. So, you know, exciting time in China. We have women's <laughs> newspapers now, not only just newspapers. So at the same time, she also got actively involved in constructing education objectives, as well as the curriculum um, of one specific school, Beiyang Women's School, in the making. The school was inaugurated in 1904 with her as the head teacher. Wow. Later, she became the principal. <laughs> Again, she was like 21, right? Oh, well, yeah. Well, so, and she, she, had, she had an in with the She had an in. With I the mean, owner. she was talented. She was, you know. So she also helped establish another woman's school in Tianjin and ran that school too later. Mm. So she was like on the ground working the scene. So let's talk about women's education in China real quick. Okay. You know, why are they how did women's schools come to be? Why did the government start pushing for this effort? This is a time when Chinese nationalism was merging. Mm -hmm. Emerging, not merging, was yeah. emerging. It didn't really quite exist all that much before amongst the masses. At the same time, the argument was that women now need to stand up. But women needed to stand up because with half of the population down, not standing <laughs> up, I guess, because their feet was bombed, it's bad for the country. Right. So women were needed to be liberated, not because women were equal to men, but because they were half of a population and they had to contribute to the country. Mm. So if you didn't liberate women, again, half the population, how could you liberate the country? Yeah. And in a way, the brand of feminism at the time, it was to contribute to the raising modern concepts of China. So it followed nationalism, this brand of yeah. feminism. And nationalism had formed and constructed this brand of feminism. Well, I think it's, you know, we've talked a lot about the opium war and, you know, century of shame and all of mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And through, throughout all of it, there was this process of like, okay, what are they doing different than us? Right? <laughs> like, what are they... What are they doing? And the first off, it was like, okay, well, they have better guns. Like, let's just yeah. get the guns, right? Or they have well, they better do troops. That. They yeah. have modern military. And then eventually they've, they kind of come to the conclusion. It's like, okay, we can't just kind of 
do the window dressing. Yeah. We actually have to change our society to be more essentially Western, not necessarily because it's right or it's better or it's more moral, but because it's more competitive in this imperialism game. Yeah. And I'm guessing... And women were resources. Yeah, women were a resource, just like, you know, and it would be very land obvious. or coal or something. Yeah, exactly, right? So, I'm, I mean, I'm not arguing that it had benefited women. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, again, this it's just... This is how it came to be. Yeah. So, that brings a problem because there's no room to just be a feminist. You have to be a nationalist first, and then because of that, you're a feminist, right? Well, you know what, and this is, you know, when you think, when you see people online who are think like somehow like patriarchal, like, you know, like, like Russia or something are tougher. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, <laughs> there's, no. A, there's a reason why Yeah, those societies all essentially lose wars and don't do very well. Yeah. Um, and this is why, right? You need to have, you need, you, you know. need to have women to carry half the sky. Yeah, in the game of Hold up in the game the of empires and war, you you know you need to utilize every resource. Yes, so women was a resource, right? So this brings conflict sometimes, yeah. as you can imagine. Um, but when that does happen, nationalism usually comes first. So women are supposed to have a role in society, but that role is still supposed to be supporting the country, supporting men essentially. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, if the two things butt against it, yeah, like you said, nationalism is going to win. Yes. So, and this conflict was reflected in Liu Bicheng's early career and later as well. So I'm quoting from the the book we mentioned, the Biographical Dictionary of Chinese Women, the 20th Century Edition. Um, a very precious and wonderful collection. Quote, she believed that the work of strengthening and saving the nation should start with education mm. and developing people's minds and changing customs and beliefs were the first steps in this process. Thus, the educational curriculum of Beiyang Women's School... <laughs> Do you know who else thought that? The great helmsman, Chairman Mao. Uh, <laughs> thus, the educational curriculum of Beiyang Women's School followed the prevailing reformist ideology of that era. It also emphasized women's moral education. Liu Bicheng asserted that women should be bold enough to aspire to personal independence, self-determination, patriotism, and strengthening the nation. Yet, she also believed that women lacking knowledge and intelligence would, quote, harm the nation, quote, if they interfered in politics, quote. So, you know, on one hand, we're like, yes, let's get women educated. But also, this is a very privileged, first, almost like a first wave feminist view yeah. that women who are not, like the peasant women don't have a place. Yeah. Right? Let's empower women. But the right women, not the riffraff. Like the ones that were born into, only the women who were born into scholar, yeah. um, you know, families go around elite circles and yeah. Are close have close guanxi i guess relationships in the government women like and, me yeah women like me so i know i still like her but i'm just saying no, no i mean yeah there are limitations yeah but also a lot of it she's is a little rich to, girl like you can't like I well mean, i mean she did lose she didn't get any money from her family I really know, but but yeah she she grew up with gotta, privilege yeah it, but also that you know this brand of that's all you could the, this brand of nationalism and feminism that's sort of that had limited how far this feminism can go. Well, and also I think there's this is a little armchair psychology, but I think if you're her and you're and you're seeing all these other women mm-hmm. in China, yeah. there's gotta there's gotta be a sense of like differentiating yourself, like, no, I'm I'm new, I'm educated, I'm different. Well, you, yeah, we're gonna talk about that in oh, a okay, second. Yeah. That you read my mind. Oh, okay. So women in public space, as she was, right, mm-hmm. was a controversial idea, even amongst the reformists. So one particular problem was that in order to get to school, in order to get educated, women w- must now travel and enter the public space. So quite often men would gather outside of women's schools in Tianjin or other cities. They would watch and comment on the female students as they come and go, enter or leave the school. Okay, like like lecherous uncles. like eh, Creeps. Eh, eh, eh. Creeps, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah so... Women got harassed on the streets while traveling to and from school as well, very often. And um, an article in a newspaper at the time reported a spectacle of a female student 
placing a letter in a post box on the street, <laughs> something as mundane as that was worth reporting, right? <laughs> and so this is my translation because obviously it was in Chinese, you know, originally. So, quote, yesterday in front of the north gate of the Chengxiang Hutong, a female student had held a letter and placed it in the post box on the street. Some bystanders some bystanders were impressed that this was so civil. Some berated her that she was out of line. Some even su suspected that she was posting a private love letter. There were many discussions and much conflict of opinion. Quote. This is what the woman had to deal with at the time. This yeah. is what Li Bichen and her students had to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you, and you know you can't do anything right. You know, like no. what if they if they get carried there in like a sedan chair? They're gonna be like. Oh, these like little princesses, right? And mm -hmm. if they're all, if they're walking there, it's like oh, these these whores, yeah, sashaying around town. Yes. Also, the whole idea of like a private letter. The, the Chinese just said private letter, which the indication is it was a private love letter. But like all letters are private. It's inside of an envelope, yeah. person to person. Yeah. It, it's you know. I guess postcards aren't private. Well, it's not a letter. I guess that's true. It's yeah. a postcard. It's a postcard. <laughs> And naturally, as more and more women did that, another problem emerged. Some Chinese women were always in the public space, namely what you would call famous courtesans mm. or prostitutes in ancient China. Judge D novels. Judge D novels. All the characters yeah. are... <laughs> I mean, also like famous, there were many famous yeah, yeah, names yeah. of, you know, yeah. um, in real history. Judge D was not real history. <laughs> as, as much as Nali wishes well, it kind to of be. was. He's a real person. Okay. <laughs> so it was a fiction, but it was a fictional. Yeah, yeah, no. we're not going to argue the veracity of whether Judge okay. D got. Sword it was one of our episodes that did the best, no. actually. So <laughs> no. I don't want to, you know, take it. I, I, yeah, I love Judge D so much. Everyone go listen to that episode. Um, so at this time in the early 1900s, these famous courtesans, high class courtesans, might mm -hmm. be called socialites. Now, yeah. Right. Kind of so, like geisha almost. Yes. So elite educated women were not allowed to enter the public space before, but they had the higher moral ground in a way. Yeah. Right? When they were and we don't inside. Mean, and we don't mean moral like in an in absolute a, scale. We mean no. within Chinese society. Yes. Yeah. yeah. For example, Li Bijan's mother, the gentry women, they were to be respected, to be protected, and they re represent a sense of like old style dignity, Confucianism. A little bird in a cage. Yeah. So I would say it was a false sense of dignity, obviously. Yeah. But, you know. Um, and women who were not traditionally married, who worked as courtesans, who had been active in society, in public spaces, at least most of the time in elite circles, you know, they had done this way earlier than the, quote, female students, teachers, scholars group. Yeah. So now there is a divide as they're both out and about in society at the same time, competing on the same stage. So that goes to what you said, you know, Lubishan had to, in a way, differentiate herself from the other women. Mm. Well, and also, not just peasant women, but namely the courtesans. Yeah, and a lot the of the courtesans, I socialize, I mean, I mean, I think compared to even a lot of elite Chinese women were probably educated, they knew things about the world, especially if they were kind of in coastal kind of cosmopolitan areas, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, or they want to get educated too. Yeah, yeah. These are professional yeah. women in their they, own they way. They were Korea, the original yeah. Korean women. <laughs> yeah. They had a Korean. Yeah. So... So this has brought a lot of conflicts for the courtesans or socialites that wanted to get educated and to enter schools. They argue that in order for them to be, quote unquote, saved <laughs> and yeah. contribute to the country, yeah. they should be given an opportunity to better themselves. But mm. of course, these public schools or even private elite Chinese women's schools weren't going to accept them. Yeah. Right. The women leaders, the teachers, the school principals from the other side was usually the first to voice their opposition <laughs> and to draw, draw the line in the sand um, to distinguish themselves as different from these lewd women, right? And yeah. push them out of schools. So on the other hand, the problem is that now that the women students and teachers are in the public space and these cities that they're in evolve into modern metropolitan spaces. Yeah. It's just, it's harder and harder to tell the difference, right? Yeah, because you go like, well, you're, you dress in Western clothes sometimes. You, you might date people, yeah, right? How are you any, date. how are well, you any different from me, right? These, you know, women students and, and, and teachers, it was popular to, for example, go to photography studios to get their photos taken, which yeah. traditionally only socialized or 
or courtesans did, and to they would go watch operas amongst men, right? They would be on the street amongst men. Yeah. They sometimes would go visit night gardens, which was apparently a thing at the time. You go visit the night garden. I don't know why it has to be a night garden. Man might buy you a drink, Cherry. You know. Sure, or tea. Yeah, or tea. <laughs> you know, once you started to participate also in fashion, mm-hmm. and you started dressing up. Who knows if you're a courtesan? Uh, or just a fashionable good woman who goes to school at the same time. Yeah, you know when we talk about you know cortisol, there's a big range there as well. Like there's people you consider like socialites. It's, it's they literally, their job isn't necessarily just to sleep with people for money. Yeah, there's a whole social aspect, and you know it's us all sorts of stuff I mean, wrapped in there. They could be a business woman. Yeah, they could be a business woman. They trade right? information. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so. This was unavoidable, but conflicts happened ne- nevertheless, right? And the division was real. And some embraced it, some resisted it from both men and women. An example of this was in 1908, Da Gongbao, the newspaper we talked about that Liu Bichun worked at and found fame through, published an article named The Failure of Models. And this article dissuaded female instructors from dressing seductively and attracting publicity (laughs) and emphasized on the importance of female teachers as a moral exemplar for their students. So they want nuns, basically. So I'm going to read this translation (laughs) um, thanks to Grace Fong, McGill University. So, quote from the article, quote, why is that some instructors I saw recently dress up so seductively? They sashay across town, (laughs) looking neither Eastern nor Western, Chinese nor foreign. Their weird appearance makes them unbearable to watch. They put silk and satin ribbons all over their heads. (laughs) Their ponytails are not braided, and they reek of perfume. (laughs) I can't possibly make out what their motives are. Would dressing up like this make people disdain you or respect you? Maybe they're afraid that people don't know that they're instructors, so they purposefully dress up in a peculiar manner to be a signboard. Quote. So, well, yeah, people just want to look good, Cherry. Uh, well, why don't you tell the writer, <laughs> who was a man, by the way. Yeah. And in a diary entry of Ying Lian Zhi, the benefactor, mentor, uh-huh. owner of the newspaper, uh-huh. admirer of Li Bichen, yeah. um, he wrote, quote, Bi Cheng saw that this was aimed at ridiculing her. <laughs> mm. She quickly published a rebuttal in a Tianjin newspaper using harsh and unreasonable words. It was really laughable. After a few days, she sent me a long letter of a thousand characters to argue. <laughs> so I replied also in more than a thousand characters. <laughs> After this, she did not come to the newspaper quarter. Quote. <laughs> So this, this was a fallout, right, yeah. between them. This was not a standalone event. This conflict or this type of conflict was yeah. reflected in her personal trajectory of life later on even. She was, by all modern definition, at this point, a socialite, not just a teacher or a scholar. Well, that's the thing. I mean, even now, right, it's mm-hmm. like people get upset, like for women. It's like you can either be a professional being or you can be in some ways like a sexual being and you can't. Madonna whore. Yeah, you can't be both, right? <laughs> yeah, Madonna whore uh, the complex. complex. Yeah. She exchanged letters with male elite scholars. Mm-hmm. She gave them her photographs to keep. She socialized with high society frequently and went to parties and gatherings. And she had a lot of photographs taken. And in them, she was always very fashionable and glamorous. I mean, but if you think about it, right? Like it's, again, this whole thing is very privileged because the only way you could be you know, the kind of woman that, that these kind of like stodgy old Chinese men want mm-hmm. is you have to just come from a rich, you have to have a rich family that'll support you. Well, in her and sense, she, 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 they she, didn't support her. I know. So she's got to. She's got to do it herself. Yeah. She's got to yeah. do it herself. Right. Yeah. So she's got to make connections. She's got to use everything she has. Yeah. And if she's like young and pretty and fashionable, then that's what she's got to do. It's either that or. Well, I maybe don't know, or starve. she just liked it, Natalie. I know. She but, could just like fashion. I know. But she also, I think, probably. It's for survival. Understands that she has to This is what she's got to do to right? climb the ladder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, well, to your point, all of these doesn't mean that she wasn't also an accomplished career woman. Yeah. It doesn't mean that she wasn't a great educator, because she was. It doesn't mean that she wasn't a great, talented writer, because she was. And I think the conflict came from that you can be both things, obviously, or many things as a woman, but China, as a society... 
resisting to change at this time, especially to the change of a woman's role in society, was just having a hard time in general with the idea that a woman can be many things. Yeah. Anyways, fast forward to 1912. The official women's school that um, she was the principal of temporarily closed with the founding of the new Republic of China because this was a government school. So the old government supposedly no longer to be until Yuan Shikai brought it back. <laughs> <laughs> so Li Bicheng was then recruited by Yuan Shikai to work as a secretary in his office. Mm. And we all know what happened very soon. Yuan Shikai declared himself emperor. It's like four years though, you know. That's pretty soon. Yeah. But she then quickly distanced herself <laughs> when that happened. So she resigned and then she moved and went to live in Shanghai. Okay. And after that, she traveled around China. She wrote about travel and she studied English, French, German, and Japanese. And she continued to socialize with celebrities, scholars, and elites. Hmm. During her time in Shanghai, she also joined a revolutionary literary society called Southern Society, Nanshu. And its purpose was to use literature to promote social reforms and revolution. Supposedly, she even ran a business and was quite successful, but we don't know what the business was. We only knew that during those years, she made enormous amounts of money, and the common s- consensus was that she was involved in trading business with Opium. Western merchants in <laughs> Shanghai. She did write about this period vaguely mm. in her own notes. Quote, After my father passed away, we brought disaster to the family because of the property. I did not receive even a penny. A deed was drawn up with public witnesses. My habits are extravagant, she was honest. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The huge sums of money I spend all come from my own savings. This is due to the fact that I am quite versed in the art of Taozhu, which Taozhu is Chinese red clay pottery. Oh, okay. So, you know, the point is, I don't know how believable that was. Like That's the only way she made her money. Well, I could see it, you know. She goes to Shanghai and schmoozes with some... Trade art, some, artifacts and... Yeah, China. some some Western import-export people. Yeah, so you she know? could. But the point was that our girl kept busy. Yeah. And even though her family wealth was robbed away from her and her mother and her sisters, she uh, made her own money enough to sustain a luxury lifestyle mm. by all means. So she lived in a Western-style mansion in Shanghai. She had a pet dog. She (laughs) didn't have to marry. She attended parties and ballroom dancing, and she kept writing. Mm. And she painted, and she practiced calligraphy. So, you know... (laughs) Doing it all. I think she was doing it all, and she was had a very fulfilled life. And she was truly an independent single woman living it up at the golden ages of Shanghai. Mm. Later, she was also able to afford international travel and an American education. Back in 1909, though, when she was studying English with the famous Chinese scholar Yan Fu, she already had asked him to recommend her to study in America through the Ministry of Education. Because in 1907, Qing government did send a small number of women scholars abroad to America. Do you know who responsible for that? <sighs> Yuan Shikai. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. You know something about Ren Shikai? What else about him? So, Ren Shikai also like the subject of this episode, his male relatives and his family kept dying. Okay. So he would get adopted by other families and they would die. But basically it meant that he was essentially raised by women. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the, his whole childhood. Okay. And so Ren Shikai had great respect for women. That's why he had like seven wives. Because of I thought he was a womanizer. He was a womanizer. Look at him. <laughs> How so... can anyone resist? <laughs> Insert a picture of your Oh, wait, this is not a video. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. This is just, <laughs> this is a podcast. Yeah. So they didn't send her. Mm. Um, her teacher supposedly thought her English was not good enough. But some other historians think that it's due to the lack of connections that her teacher also had. Didn't, like your, it wasn't, didn't your teachers also think your English was bad? They did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was a... Bad student. I was a bad student. <laughs> English was my worst subject. <laughs> So this is getting to Cherry's like yeah. psychology chair. Let's, let's this hear it. Psychologist couch. Let's situation. hear it. People have heard 50 hours of us, you know, they can hear some Cherry. Let's get the psychology. Oh, okay. Well, in middle school, well, it's just that I, I had transfer schools, Yeah. but my, you know, so I had like maybe three years short of English education. Mm-hmm. So when I entered middle school, I wasn't, I had to catch up, mm. but also I think I just, I wasn't very good at 
English tests and grammar. Mm. Like it just, it didn't work because my English was so bad. My other subjects are way better than English. So my English teacher thought I was like playing a trick on her. Like, <laughs> she's like, you must be doing this on, the, on like on purpose. To get back at me. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I was like, I'm not. <laughs> she's, but they're like, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, so my English got better. It was mm. fine. In 1920, supporting herself at the age of 37, she was heading to America, to mm. Colombia. So she studied fine arts and literature at the same time worked as foreign correspondent for a Chinese newspaper. Mm. So she stayed at the Pennsylvania Hotel, which was a luxury hotel. She socialized with elite rich women of New York, too. And after that, she went to live in San Francisco for a while. And then she traveled around in America. In 1927, she traveled around. She traveled to England, France, Italy and Switzerland, basically all over Europe. And all the while, she continued writing and publishing Chinese magazines. And it was during those years, she started devoting herself to the writing and studying of Buddhist doctrine. She started writing about Buddhism and at the same time become, became an advocate for vegetarianism and animal rights mm. in line with her Buddhist beliefs. And quoting from the Biographical Dictionary of Chinese Women, again, quote, she herself converted to Buddhism in Geneva, in spring 1930. That's an interesting place to convert to Buddhism, Switzerland. <laughs> right? She lived in Switzerland for quite a few years, okay. by the way. Um, Li Bichun produced no literary, literary work from then on, maintaining that all earthly things were but dreams and illusion, wisdom being all. That's convenient. Quote. Right? Why don't you say that next time? We'll say the next time at work, something doesn't get done. I'll be like, so all earthly things are just dreams and illusions. Exactly. Illusion, so. So later, she returned to Hong Kong in 1939 when World War II started and passed away in 1943 in Hong Kong due to, well, due to illness in a Buddhist sanctuary. Mm. You know, I know I shortened the part about Buddhism in, in her life, but we can have another episode about that. Um, it was an important chapter mm. for her. When I was reading about her story, I was thinking she was her own person. At the time when a woman not just in China, but everywhere else in the world, rarely had the chance to just be her own person. And of course, you can't deny that she had some privileges most other Chinese women didn't have at the time. But I think in many like important crossroads of her life, she made a choice to be her own person. Yeah. And namely, one important thing was that she had this individualism that was very different. So obviously, she early career as an educator as a school principal at a public school, as a nationalist feminist, yeah. she was very much aligned with the Chinese nationalism. Yeah. But you can see that through her trajectory when she went abroad, when she converted to Buddhism, she had given up, well, she not had given up, but she had made a choice that she was not a spokesperson for Chinese women or Chinese people. Well, she, yeah. It's interesting to me because, and, and you know, to a certain extent, she died kind of. A little too early. She did. But, but like, there's sort of three trajectories if you make it through that time period mm -hmm. of what you, what, you, what you can do politically, right? To be, as you end up as a famous person in China, yeah. you either are with the KMT, yeah. you're with the communists, mm -hmm. or you're with some sort of puppet government thing, yeah. right? You're with the foreigners. Yeah. And... She didn't have to she do, didn't do any of those. She yeah. just like, yeah, no, I'm, she's like, no, nope, I'm, I'm good. These are all earthly things. I'm going to go live in Switzerland. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to advocate for animal rights. Yeah. Right. And so obviously this is going to rub some people wrong because how dare she not sacrifice everything for the country, Cherry? Exactly. At a time when obviously China was in crisis. I'm not denying that. Right. Yeah. So the whole of like the first 20th century, China was in crisis. <laughs> yeah. Never stopped. But I mean, why is it her job to fight for the country you know yeah so that's one view obviously um when the country didn't do her any favors and everything she got she kind of had to claw claw her way yeah and almost yeah. all the other women around her i mean well one of her supposedly best friend cho jin the famous chinese revolutionary feminist let's talk about her died very very young she R rock star yeah she died for and she had this picture with this japanese um 
outfit like what, what do you call it kimono like, kimono outfit and but with a sword <laughs> like she looked like a women warrior On very Abushi. fierce but she died very early and she died in the name of you know revolutionary for a new china true and rock stars die young jerry she did right and then Li Bichen at one point had to like apparently like like sneak and like bury her like fetch her body because it was you know she was executed basically so so Li Bichen's life is a completely different trajectory yeah compared to a die young for the country feminist martyr mm-hmm. or nationalist feminist martyr right yeah and again some people might have a problem with it but i mean she made her choice to just she's going to turn her attention outwards right she's going to travel around the world and she is not going to advocate for the KMT government because the, the CCP government didn't come to be yet. Yeah. Um, but she decided that she's going to advocate for other things Maybe rather than having a- Chinese being Chinese as her main identity. Maybe she didn't advocate for the KMT, Cherry, because she was a Ren Chikai loyalist. I don't think she was. Oh, you don't think so? I think she distanced herself <laughs> after the <laughs> emperor. I think Do few emperors people have are- secretaries? <laughs> no, I don't know. So, you know... Maybe just she didn't have a job anymore. Yes. So obviously <laughs> it's a debate to how she portrayed herself and decided to live her life against the larger historical backdrop of that was the what was the messy scenario of China mm. in first twentieth century. But at the same time she refused to marry. She could have had many chances to enter a prestigious marriage with Chinese elites, yeah. I'm sure. And she but she was wealthy. You know, and she lived her luxury lifestyle and she didn't have to get married. She just wanted, you know, she had fun, I think. And but in the end, though, she also sort of gave it all up to (laughs) living a Buddhist like sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she had no children. Her ashes were, I think, spread into the ocean. It was a very clean, (laughs) clean ending like she wanted. Life is an illusion, Sherry. Life is an illusion. She would agree. Yeah. Or at least the last maybe 20 years of her life, she was free. <laughs> maybe not when she was living a luxury yeah. lifestyle. So, so yeah. So that's that's our main character today. Mm. Maybe less about China. Maybe we're just it's just more about a Chinese woman. No, but it is story. about it is about because the the stuff that she had to deal with, mm-hmm. right? It touches all of the kind of tumultuous nature of yeah. those of those decades right yeah she kind of had her own little personal to live no i mean like the movie to live oh the, the watch, movie to live of like yes. just having to, to go through all the different eras right and yeah. from trying to kind of you know essentially be an independent woman in the kind of the Qing period mm-hmm. kind of claw place for herself and the new government and mm-hmm. the you know new china and then becoming sort of an international figure and well, figuring the, it out. Well, you could argue the government rejected her wish to be sent abroad as a government agent. <laughs> yeah. And then so she did it herself. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the same. Her uncle didn't didn't let her go. So yeah. she just went herself. Yes. The government right. didn't let her go. So she just made the money and went herself. Yes, exactly. So that was her story. What do you think? I think it's interesting. You know, because there's this, also this whole parallel, which, you know, like, we didn't really get into, but I almost, we could do an episode. There's a whole parallel track. You know, you talked about kind of socialites and you talked about these kind of women's school in Tianjin, but there's a whole third track yeah. of Chinese women who are getting educated and essentially even growing up westernized. Yes. And going to a Western international schools around Shanghai or orphanages, right? Yes. And growing up there going abroad Mm -hmm. essentially being like almost like a hundred percent western yeah and then kind of trying to having to interact with uh like like the song sisters basically Mm -hmm. like that are are also kind of have their own feelings different than uh than someone like lupe yeah yeah yeah, her yeah i mean the song sisters histories obviously have been yeah like like written about many times um i don't know if we're gonna do an episode on them but yeah that is an interesting parallel yeah well you know may every chinese woman woman everywhere korean woman korean, <laughs> korean, woman. Woman, korean woman you know just be yourself want to yeah. be a nationalist you could you know if you don't want to be don't be a nationalist for the current government well it's their choice mm. but you know 
Yeah, even though I might be against <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So may you draw inspirations from Li Bichun's story, like I did. See you next time. See you next time.